We're in the middle of our uh, ongoing discussion about this way of reading Paul's letters that can be called an epistolary analysis approach or a letter structure approach or a form critical approach. And so far, we've not only been introduced to the idea in theory, but we've also looked at the letter openings, but just the first of the three elements of the letter opening, the center unit. And so now we continue our discussion by looking at the next two elements of the center unit, the recipient and then also the opening. Opening greeting. So the first thing we have to do is we first have to determine what Paul normally does here at this point of his letter because again if we don't know what he normally does we'll not be that alert reader to see when he does something different and to pick up its potentially exegetical significance. So what does Paul normally do? He has two elements. He normally begins by saying to the church of and of course uh, the of part will change depending on church and location but the second thing that he has is what I want to stress is a positive descriptive phrase. He refers to his readers as either those in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ or simply in Christ Jesus or beloved of God or called to be holy. If I used any of these descriptions of you, if I said you are somebody who is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, I suspect your shoulders would go up and you'd feel kind of good about yourself and you should because I would have praised you. I would have acknowledged that you stand in this uh, positive and healthy spiritual relationship with God and or Christ. Well that's what Paul normally does. Let's look at uh, all of his letters and see if any of them are unusual or unique. And the one that emerges right away is Galatians. It starts off like this. To the churches in Galatia. Cricket, cricket, cricket. To catch, I hope, the significance of what is happening here. How Paul has omitted any positive descriptive phrase. In other words, the situation is so bad or serious in the Galatian churches that Paul can't acknowledge in any way that they stand in a relationship with God and or Christ. It's a sad thing to see, but it nevertheless is an important clue at how serious the situation is in these churches and also uh, reflects the very concerned tone that Paul has in uh, these particular letters. An analogy is a little bit similar to the seven letters, maybe better called the seven sermons, to the seven churches of Revelation. In Revelation 2 and 3 we have the seven sermons, and the last one written to Laodicea is the worst, the unhealthiest of all the churches. And I know that because all of the letters, Paul Norm, uh, Jesus uh, in Revelation, normally has something both positive and negative to say. But in the sermon to the Laodiceans, chapter 3 of Revelation, Jesus has no positive words at all, only a criticism, only negative words. Somewhat similar to what Paul does here in his letter to the Galatians. And so again we see how Paul is not just a robot who blindly does what everyone else is doing in letter writing on that day or even what he does elsewhere. Instead we see that Paul is a skilled letter writer and he's able to adapt, uh, uh, maybe in musical terms, you know, he can, he can freestyle if you will, but he can certainly change things so that they better and more accurately and closely reflect the tone and the purpose of uh, the document as a whole. As another example that's good to look at is the little letter to Philemon. Notice how Paul identifies the recipient in this particular document. He says, to Philemon, our beloved and fellow worker. Let's just stop right there. And notice that Paul calls Philemon our beloved. Agapetos is the Greek word that he uses. Now, the skeptic in you might rightfully say something like, well, you know, don't read too much into that, Wyma. I mean, Christians are into love, aren't they? And so what else is he going to say about Philemon other than maybe use this very common generic word, love? However, you have to remember that this is a very short letter, a very carefully crafted letter, and the word love appears not once, not twice, not three, not four, but five times. In fact, a good way to, I think, get at what Paul is doing here is to use the analogy of an ATM machine. Maybe you have that, you have some money, and you roll up to the ATM machine, and you, what, you deposit some money. And you do that because not only is it safe, but you hope it will, it will gain some interest. But then one day you'll drive up to the ATM machine and you do something different. You'll withdraw. You'll take money out, hopefully more than what you put in. In a similar way, Paul is depositing something in this letter. He's not depositing money. He's depositing praise. At the very beginning of the letter, he's identifying Philemon as a person who, what, who has been loved, who's experienced love from Paul and from Timothy. And Paul continues that later in the letter, too. 
In the next unit of the letter, the Thanksgiving section, we haven't looked at that in detail, we will uh, do so very soon, but Paul, notice he, he says something like this, I'm putting my hand up because he says, I give thanks to God for what you Philemon are doing, and he highlights your love. And notice where that love is directed, it's love for all the saints. Saints is just another word for fellow Christians. In other words, Paul highlights the love that Philemon has, not so much for God and or Christ, although that was surely there, but he's highlighting Philemon's love for fellow Christians. Paul never says what that love involves, but I'm sure it was a lot more than Philemon running around saying to different Christians, I love you, man. Instead, he must be, that is, Philemon must be providing food or housing or employment or whatever other needs uh, Christians might have. And then notice how Paul stresses this kind of love that Philemon demonstrates toward other Christians. He says in verse 7, so it's still part of the Thanksgiving section, he says, Your love uh, has refreshed the hearts of the saints. And so for a second time, adding emphasis, Paul has deposited praise, so to say, into uh, the bank of goodwill that he's hopefully building with uh, Philemon. Now, if you see how the word love, love, love three times in the letter thus far is used, then you'll hopefully better appreciate what Paul does then now in the body of the letter. So in verses 8 and 9, Paul turns to the body of the letter, and it's here where he begins, and I'm going to say it the Greek word order than the English word order. The English word order is just, I appeal to you more because of love. And so the idea is that Paul is now withdrawing. He's saying, three times so far I've said you're a loving kind of person, especially loving toward other Christians, and now I'm about to ask you to act in a loving way toward yet another Christian. I haven't mentioned his name yet, but he's going to be your runaway slave, Onesimus. And the Greek again stresses this idea of love even more, because in Greek it begins with the phrase, more because of love I appeal to you. So Paul fronts it in the first part of the sentence in order to stress that characteristic that he's been building all along. And in case you're still a skeptic, well then you have to also see verse 16. There's some question about Philemon as to the, the heart of what Paul is asking, and that's because Paul is kind of dancing around this sensitive subject, and as a result, uh, contemporary interpreters are sometimes uh, not agreed at what Paul is actually asking, but most agree that at least the key ought to be found in verse 16, and notice what we read here. He says that you'll receive this runaway slave no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as an beloved agapetos brother. So the same characteristic that I identified you as having at the beginning of the letter, now this is how I'm asking you to act and to treat toward this runaway slave of yours of whom I am writing. And so, when you look at uh, this example, it's hard to, again, see that Paul did this by accident or fluke chance, but it looks like he's shaped or he's adapted the letter opening of Philemon so that it better suits uh, the purpose, the heart of what the letter is all about. But Paul does more. If you go back to the beginning, notice how he, even though it's written to Philemon, even though in Greek you can distinguish between the you singular and the you plural, and Paul uses the you singular throughout the letter with one exception, notice how he deliberately includes other people in the recipient formula. He says, not just to Philemon, but also to Apphia, also to Archippus, and then to the church that meets at your house. What's going on here? Well, let me suggest to you that a request made in public is a lot harder to turn down than a request made in private. This should be easy for you to see if, um, if we see each other in the hallway, say, here at Calvin Seminary, and let's imagine that, I don't know, I, I came to seminary and, uh, you know, it's a miserable day and I just noticed my tire is flat. And you know how us egghead professors are, we don't know anything about cars, and so I say, you know, can you help me after class, you know, change this tire? Well, I could imagine you saying to yourself, you know, I got better things to do than spend time with Wyma, and, and you could maybe in a more diplomatic way come up with some easy excuse to uh, beg off of that request. But let's imagine now that I ask you in front of the whole class, you know, there's like 15 or 20 people in the classroom, and all the eyes are looking at you, Wyma has, you know, has, has asked you if something, he's in trouble, and, and so there's a fair amount of pressure now. Everyone's saying, you know, what kind of person are you? Are you going to help him out? Are you going to say yes or no? Or I'll give you yet another example, if that will help. Maybe you're invited to some uh, fundraising dinner, right? And so the speaker gets up there and has a rousing speech about this particular cause, and then somewhere toward the end, he or the host will, will, will come and say something like this. Now, there's this envelope on your table, and I want you to take that envelope and what? You know, 
He'll say, now, put it in your pocket, and then, when, you know, your purse, and when you get home, in the privacy of... No, they don't, they don't say that at all. Of course not. They say, now, fill it out right here, right in front of all these friends and family and other people who know you around the table. Because, again, there's mo it's, it's more difficult to turn down a request made in public than in private. And, and one other analogy, more related to letters, has to do with uh, CC. I had a situation sometime where somebody accused me of doing something, something not very nice at all. And even though this person uh, wasn't there, and even though they didn't talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, you know, following the biblical principles of, uh, of Matthew and elsewhere, this person wrote a letter challenging me and accusing me of this, this not very nice thing. And at the very bottom of the letter, uh, not so innocently, it was written CC. President of Calvin Theological Seminary, President of the Board of Trustees. You see, this person deliberately made this accusation a public one and thereby put pressure on me. And uh, that was too bad for uh, the reasons I've already indicated, not handling it differently. Well, maybe that's not a great example because it's more negative, but I do want you to see how, again, a request made in public is harder to turn down than one made in private. And so I suggest to you that Paul has deliberately made this personal request to Philemon, a more public matter. He mentions Apia, likely his wife. He mentions Archippus, likely the interim pastor of the Colossian church that meets in uh, Philemon's home. And then he mentions the whole church that meets in your house. So everybody over there will know about the situation. And, and the eyes are on Philemon, and he feels that. How is he going to respond? What's he going to say to Paul? And, and Paul does the same thing in the letter closing, which we may or may not get to, uh, but it'll be in the notes at least. But Paul then makes the greeting. So it's not only everybody over on Philemon's end knows about the situation, but everybody with Paul knows about it too. And it's striking that Paul mentions first at the end of the letter Epaphras. Who's Epaphras? Well, he's the pastor of the Colossian church. He's Philemon's pastor. And he's also the only one identified in the greeting list in the number one position, position of importance or emphasis, but who has a title, namely prisoner, which you'll remember from before is also not so innocent because that's the title that Paul used at the opening of the letter. And so here's yet another way in which Paul has uh, adapted the letter opening of Philemon to strengthen his persuasive purposes. Here's a quote from one scholar which recognizes this very fact. Uh, Norman Peterson says, Social pressure on Philemon is secured most conspicuously by Paul's addressing his letter not only to Philemon, but also to Apphia Archippus and the entire church that meets in Philemon's house. Well, that now marks the end, at least the time we have to look at the second element of the letter opening, the recipient. And so now we move to the third element, and that is the opening greeting, to be distinguished from the closing greetings. And so again, we first have to look what Paul normally does, and then we'll see if he does something unique or different, and whether that might be significant. So what does Paul normally do? Well, uh, if I would stand in front of a church, put my hands up, I, I would do this because that's the posture I and many preachers typically use uh, these words, where Paul extends a greeting, right, uh, to the congregation. And the wish itself is made up of two parts, namely grace and peace. And even though preachers use this all the time, I'm not sure they always know, and I'm quite confident that the people in the pew hardly ever know, that actually this is a very biblically inclusive greeting. Why? Well, first of all, let's take the second one, uh, peace. Peace is a typical Jewish greeting, right? Shalom in Hebrew, but in Greek it would be Irene, or Irene is the woman's name, meaning peace. What about the other term, grace? Well, you can see here that the typical secular greeting used, you know, like 99% of the time in secular letters of that day is harain, harain. It means literally rejoice, but functionally speaking, very, very common expression for hello, greetings. And so what it looks like Paul has done is he's taken a secular Greek greeting, harain, and he's Christianized it to charis, grace. And he adds the Jewish greeting, shalom, and as a result, Paul has a very effective, a very powerful, inclusive greeting, one that captures both Jew and Gentile believer alike. Second, there is the recipient, which is simply you, the people to whom the letter is addressed. And then you have the source, which is both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it's helpful at this point for me to highlight for you that there's a very clever inverted chiasm between the opening of the letter and the closing of the letter. I can't quite do it in here because the screen isn't that large, but if you take the opening greetings, grace and peace, 
at the end of the letter, they're inverted, an inverted chiasm, because the first element of the letter closing is a wish for peace, grace and peace, and so the end of the letter is now peace, and it's always associated with God. May the peace of God be with you. And then the last greeting is then, understandably, grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so the opening greeting and the closing greetings act in a kind of framing way to package or to hold uh, the stuff in between, namely the body of the letter. Well, with that in mind, let's look and see if there are any uh, opening greetings that are unusual or unique. We find ourselves back in the letter of Galatians, and it starts off normal enough. We read, grace and peace, the two wishes are entirely normal. You see, to you, the recipients, is entirely normal. And then we get from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're about to say it's normal, but then we realize Paul hasn't stopped. After mentioning Jesus Christ, he says, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, there is this expanded part to the opening. And it's unusual, because of course it's longer, but it also ends with that doxology, right? To whom be glory forever and ever. Now, if you look at this expanded part more closely, as I've had a chance to do, you probably would see relatively soon that this expansion part highlights the what? The salvific or the redemptive work of Christ. I mean, notice the lines. Who gave himself for our sins. I mean, that's powerful language. That's, that's kind of like substitutionary atonement language. Jesus is, is giving his life for our sake, to pay for our sins. And the next line is equally uh, redemptive, right? To deliver us. Maybe you could better translate that to rescue us from the present evil age. And so what I notice about this expansion is Paul is highlighting the salvific or the redemptive work of Christ. And so we ask, as we had before, is this by accident or fluke chance, or is it deliberate and potentially significant? And just like in all the other examples, the latter case is clearly the right option. Now to understand that, we have to look at the Galatian situation, which we did just a while ago. I'll remind you that I told you then about the Judaizers, those who had invaded. They were from Jerusalem. They claimed to be believers, Jewish believers. They came from Jerusalem and they had kind of taken over uh, the Galatian churches. And they not only had a bad attitude toward Paul, they undermined his authority, that's what we talked about before, causing Paul to have a preemptive strike in the opening, highlighting that he got his divine apostleship, not from any of the head boys in Jerusalem, none of any of the apostles, but he got it directly from Jesus Christ himself. But they also had a bad gospel. In fact, Paul says it's no gospel at all. We might call their gospel a Jesus plus gospel. They said, yes, you have to believe in Jesus plus. And what was the plus? Well, it had to do with elements that highlighted the Jewish character of their faith and their background. It was like Jesus plus circumcision, or Jesus plus a lot more importance to the law of Moses, or Jesus plus uh, certain foods, you know, clean foods as opposed to unclean foods, or Jesus plus, make sure you follow the religious calendar. And there's a big problem with a Jesus plus theology. And as soon as you say plus after Jesus, and it doesn't matter whether the plus is one thing or many things, it doesn't matter whether it's a small thing or a great thing, as soon as you say a plus after Jesus, you what? You undermine, you take away from the full sufficiency of Christ's redemptive work. You're saying, Jesus died for my sins, but somehow that's not enough. There has to be something else to kind of put me over the top or to make sure that I experience full salvation. And so one of the big things in the body of the letter is for Paul to highlight how false this gospel plus, this Jesus plus gospel is, and to highlight then the full redemptive work of Christ. And so what does Paul do? Already in the letter opening, he offers another preemptive strike, stressing exactly the very same thing. He stresses already at the beginning of the letter that Jesus is and has done it all, such that there is no need for any plus. I have a quote here from Richard Longenecker, who is my New Testament professor many years ago when I was working on my PhD. He has a very good commentary in Galatians, and notice what he says. To this standard, though enriched, opening, 
Okay, so we're looking at the opening. We're looking at the opening greeting. And it was standard because it has grace and peace. It has to you from God the Father, the Lord Jesus. But then he says, though enriched. And so it's that enriched or expanded part that we've been talking about. He says, Paul adds what appears to be a portion of an early Christian confession. So Langenecker is saying not only is this extra material, but he's also arguing that this is confessional material that Paul is borrowing. It may or may not be that doesn't really matter uh, for my point. But I want you to hear him say that, that this extra material, whether it's confession or not, speaks of Christ's work and the purpose of that work for mankind. This was written a few years ago. We would say today, humankind salvation. In so doing, Paul highlights a further important theme of the letter, namely the full sufficiency of Christ's work for humankind salvation apart from any works of the Mosaic Law. And so we have yet another example of how Paul has taken a part of the letter opening and in certain contexts, right, he has uh, expanded it in order that it uh, better relates to the specific situation at hand and the purposes that he is going to develop uh, in the body of the letter. Well, this brings us uh, to the end of our study of the letter opening. And so we'll take a quick break and then we'll uh, tackle the next part of the letter, the Thanksgiving section. <laughs>